Okay, well, we're still having people coming in to our pre-concert chat, and I hope that continues here throughout the, uh, throughout the course of the proceedings. And just to reiterate one more time, as you come in, you know, Rich will try to keep everybody muted, and please do uh, submit comments via the chat function. That's a really efficient way to continue conversation without getting into the whole um, Zoom traffic jam with, with different people speaking at once. Uh, we don't have as much time tonight as I'm sure we all want, so I, I want to make sure I get through as much of this background as I can for you. And also, uh, we're going to put this up on uh, Facebook and YouTube after it's over so that uh, you can revisit it or pass it along to friends, too, and let them know that, uh, hey, there's a pre-concert chat, and you can see that, too. Um, now, one of the things I was mentioning before the chat came online is that um, we... In recording this concert, we decided to have some spoken interludes. We, we've just done a number of things that we normally couldn't do in a regular concert in terms of timing and in terms of the way we, we kind of um, lay out the whole program. And so one of those is the ability to, to address things really specific to the music right in the moment, right after the piece ends. So I do that on the concert, and you're going to hear some dates and some names. I mean, you're going to get some really great kind of program note type information about the pieces during the show. So what I wanted to do uh, for the time we have together before the show starts tonight is to give you insight into this whole week, how we even got here. We started planning more than a year ago to do a celebration of Beethoven's music. And this is something that orchestras around the world are doing. Um, lots of different takes on it, many different ways to kind of commemorate this, this really you know, major milestone in the history of classical music. Um, and we laid out a vision for a week of Beethoven festivities and partnerships. Um, we were having, uh, we had a, on the schedule, we had planned collaborations with um, multiple different university groups. And we had a soloist engaged to work with the orchestra. We were going to do a concert at the Brown Derby. We, were, we had a whole thing laid out with the youth art team, a project that was going to premiere this week. And of course, as we all now remember, um, I'm sure somewhat ruefully, the middle of March came around and everybody's plans changed. And so did our Beethoven plans along with the, with the plans for the rest of the season. So in place of that, that week of um, in-person activities, we ultimately decided to develop this week of, of online activities. And I hope you've had a chance to take advantage of this already. Or if you haven't, if you're just coming to our Beethoven 250 celebration, you know, kind of cold tonight, I would really suggest you go back and take a look at some of the programming that the symphony staff has put together. Um, I feel really proud of this whole week and the way that we've taken a theme which is quite common in the classical music world this year and really put a different spin on it and I hope given you some really fresh insight into all the things that go on not just in in looking at Beethoven's music but even just in the creative process more generally um, and I think ultimately that's one of the most amazing things about Beethoven himself using him as a foil for uh, creativity and expression. That really, in the, in the end, that really is the underlying message of this entire week, is that he seems to represent a sort of, the, the, I guess I would say, the willfulness of creativity, um, the sort of unstoppable kind of act of creation that we just sense when we hear Beethoven's music. Um, you listen to Mozart, who we're gonna hear on the concert tonight, and it feels more effortless, like it just came flowing out from him. And we listen to Beethoven and we, we I think, have a different impression. We get the feeling of, of the struggle and, and the sublimity, the, the, the achievement, the disappointments. It all seems to be in the music itself. And that's why I think Beethoven can be such an incredible catalyst for talking about art and talking about creativity. And that's really what we've done a lot of this whole week. So. We, we did continue on with our youth art team collaboration, and if you don't know uh, the youth art team yet, um, you, please check out our, our Live from the Archive uh, episode, which came out last weekend, and that features a project we did with the youth art team, um, pairing their artwork with the music of Beethoven, which they learned and studied in order to create that artwork. The, the art they created was in response to listening to Beethoven and learning about him. Uh, it was such a great collaboration. It was done entirely virtually, so we didn't have any direct physical contact. Uh, but I think the results really speak for themselves. It's a wonderful expression of, um, of creativity from these three young men who participated in the summer, in this virtual summer camp. 
Uh, and then we had some other behind the scenes type episodes this week. I hope you'll have a chance to check them out. Um, as to the program itself tonight that we arrived at after all these other activities, um, it's sort of, it's a bit of a hybrid, I would say. We had originally planned to do a concert at the Brown Derby, and the centerpiece of that concert was to be the Beethoven Septet. And this is a really fascinating piece of music, which is, um, sits at a unique sort of point in Beethoven's compositional career. And as you'll see tonight, it also has a connection with a whole other uh, type of music uh, that existed during this period of time uh, around the turn of the 19th century. So we modified the program a little bit to accommodate a couple of things. One was when we performed at the Brown Derby, we sit very close together. We're close to all of you. Um, obviously, it was clear from pretty early on in the spring that sitting that closely together for any of us wasn't going to be in the cards, at least not indoors, for a period of time. So immediately we began thinking about how we would need to set up. And it did become clear early on that, uh, at least initially in getting together with the orchestra, we would be in a position of setting up in a spatially distanced manner. And you'll see that in the video tonight, and you may have seen some of the pictures on Facebook uh, and Instagram earlier, where the players and myself, at, at a minimum, are 10 feet apart and often much further. In fact, um, the way we ended up visualizing this was looking at the way the orchestra normally sits on stage. Imagine a bird's eye view looking down on the stage. And if you took each section of the orchestra, but you only left behind one player of that instrument, then we have our spatially distanced setup of a minimum of 10 feet between the players. So interestingly enough for us, even though we were forced to play this music, which normally we play sitting very close together, when we got on stage, uh, everybody was pretty comfortable in terms of their position. You have to uh, realize that these players get really used to where they are on the stage, and that's how they achieve such a high level of blend and ensemble that you know you hear when the full orchestra plays. So in this case, they're sitting in the same positions, but there are all these bodies and chairs and everything else that's missing around them. And with that adjustment, we did have to make some adjustments to the program because there's just certain music that becomes much more difficult to play once we're separated. And also, there were lots of other issues. Extra rehearsal time required to become accustomed to the setup. Um, and obviously, now we're recording a program that also required extra time to allow us to deal with the technical aspects of recording the program with video. And then also multiple takes if we feel like we need to run another movement another time or something like that. So the whole process was very different and we had to make some adjustments in the planning and in the, in the actual you know, rehearsal process to be able to accommodate that. However, I'd say I think, I think things went really well and, and I think you're gonna hear that this evening on the concert. Um, so so uh, we wound up with this program still highlighting Beethoven's septet, but in a lot of ways taking a deeper dive into the constellation of ideas that surround the Beethoven Septet. And I describe it that way for a, a particular reason, to say a constellation of ideas. Um, because very often, you know, when we look at a, a piece of music or a composer, we, we really tend to see it in isolation. Maybe we see it on a concert program with some other composers who, who might be somewhat related. Um, I know if you've come to our concerts, you often see pieces that are connected and kind of in conversation with one another. But I think sometimes when we look at, let's say the classical period, we're really looking at this tiny snapshot of what actually went on, both in terms of the cultural continuum, the ideas that were passed on to these composers and which they passed on forward to the next generation. There's that whole stream. And then there's a whole other element of just the contemporary context what else was going on around these composers musically, non-musically, you know, understanding that historical background. And then on top of that, there's always the whole, the whole idea of you know, how do we make this relevant for today? How do we approach the score, the document, and, and bring it to life? And Beethoven provides us with just an amazing opportunity to do those kinds of things, especially in a program like this, where we use his septet, this kind of early landmark work in his career, as the bookends on this concert. And inside is all this other information about what brought Beethoven to that septet and, and where his piece and his music sort of moved things for the future generations of composers. And so for that reason, um, we, we've got a little bit more of a, uh, 
I guess, a concert journey um, going on tonight that spans about 50 years, mainly in the city of Vienna, but especially looking at the culture of music in the city of Vienna, which was the home of what's known as this first Viennese style, the, the kind of high classical style. And so I'll, I'll share some musical com uh, uh, some, some comments about the music of this period now, and then I'd like to pause. Uh, I want to remind everybody that you can leave a comment or a question in the chat, which is open right now. And then hopefully if we've got a couple minutes, we're going to pause at the end and do, um, you know, just kind of open up the lines and see if anybody wants to share a, a, a verbal comment. Before we do that, let me just um, stop and restart my recording device. I want to I want to split the files. It'll enable me to get it up, I think, a little faster tonight, <laughs> and that's our goal. So give me one sec to do that. We've learned so much about the complexities of producing events like the ones we're doing now. Um, I think we've always been pretty good about trying to be out there on Facebook and let you know what's going on, but now we're really trying to bring you inside the musical experience while we're all sitting at home staring at screens. And somebody who has a lot to do with that is on the chat tonight, um, and that's Blake Argusinger. And he, um, he has just um, worked wonders um, with our with everything you see. I mean, it's from, from the technical side to the look of things to help us unify all of this into a, a, a musical channel that highlights the life of the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony. And so I know not everybody's on video, but you can put it in the chat, you can use your emoji, but I feel like we all have to do the applause um, right now for Blake. And, uh, you know, it can go in the chat or if you hover over your name, you might be able to put an emoji up there. And bravo, Blake, thank you so much. So, um, about the music on this program and the connection um, between these pieces. We, we begin with Beethoven's Septet, which, which is written um, in 1799 and 1800. And uh, it's a perfect date, <laughs> you know. It, it's actually exactly 25 years after the first piece on the program and 25 years before the last piece on the program. So, um, so it sits directly in the middle of all the music you're going to hear tonight. And of course, it's for seven instruments, a mixture of woodwinds and strings, um, really in a way kind of a mini orchestra. But this ensemble starts to become codified at this time. In other words, we start to see all kinds of composers begin writing music for this type of ensemble. And it becomes a very popular format for a relatively short period of time, 25, 30, maybe 40 years. And then we really don't see very much music written for an ensemble like this, individual string players and individual wind players, until later on in the 20th century. And when I look at that, it just makes me wonder, why did this form arise? Why was it so popular that the t leading composers all sort of dipped their toe in it, and then it kind of goes extinct and, and we don't really hear it anymore? And I think it's because it's connected both to a set of ideas that passed through music history during this time and also a very strong connection between the socio-historical circumstances of these composers and the music they were writing. And that's what I think sometimes we do lose when we hear these pieces in isolation from one another or from their context. So, uh, so when we start with the Beethoven and we go back 25 years to hear Mozart writing dance music just as he's about to move to Vienna and take on a job in Vienna as the court composer of dance music, it really sets the stage for us to understand these composers as individuals who didn't, you know, sit at the writing desk and just dream something up. Uh, there were very specific parameters around what kinds of music they wrote and why they wrote it, who commissioned the music, who they were beholden to and delivered the music to. Um, and that we sometimes lose all of this context if we hear the, the music in isolation. But Mozart is such a prime example of a composer who clearly was a genius. It was recognized during his lifetime. And yet, really the only paid position he ever held in Vienna right after he left Salzburg was to be the composer of, of court dance music. Uh, now Mozart wrote some great dance music, but I'm sure no one would say that is his towering achievement. Um, you look at the operas, the symphonies, the piano concertos, but here he was, the only regular salary he pulled was was doing this. But when you hear the music, you'll see how much of uh, vitality is in it and how much it seems to speak of the actual um, experiences, the lived experience of the composers. It's so hard when you hear a symphony to go, well, this composer, you know, heard something out in, in nature and then wrote it in his symphony. You know, Beethoven moved us in that direction. 
Uh, but it's always very hard to ascribe specific experiences to something that happens in a piece of music unless it's explicitly biographical. However, um, when you listen to Mozart, I think you can hear and feel the fact that this music is not really concert music, so to speak, but it was music for use. It was intended to be used, to, to be danced to, to be listened to at a party or a social event. Um, the fact that, uh, that this was what he essentially did for a living um, it is really notable, and of course, Beethoven came to Vienna after Mozart had. Mozart was his elder, but he knew Mozart, venerated him. Uh, all these composers actually had personal connections, so everyone we're talking about would have crossed paths and met in person in Vienna. And, um, you know, here we have Beethoven uh, kind of looking at the prospects in Vienna, and as we know, um, him coming just a little bit later, keep in mind here, we're talking about 1776, when Mozart wrote this piece, is the year of the American Revolution. Uh, of course, the French Revolution takes place shortly thereafter. Uh, major upheaval around the Western world. And this is taking place right as Beethoven is coming into maturity. And so we would naturally expect certain things to start changing. And what does happen is that this, this serenade-type music, multi-movement pieces, five, six, seven movements in these pieces, often with multiple dance movements, these start to become you know, sort of really popular uh, uh, regular entertainments, um, we see all kinds of composers. Mozart wrote a boatload of amazing wind music that we've heard at the symphony for a lot of these types of settings. And Beethoven's Septet, while we don't really know a lot about um, its genesis, uh, I think we know enough, but, but maybe not all the, the colorful details, um, you know, we can assume this piece spoke directly to listeners as a piece of music that had a strong social backdrop to it. It wasn't just concert music in the sense of going to hear a new symphony, um, which itself, I would argue, also had a strong social component, but this music much more so. And you can hear it in, in all of the pieces we're gonna play today, and you hear Beethoven adopting some of this style, even from Mozart, um, while, of course, using his own uh, formal approach. Now, uh, we'll skip Beethoven at 1800, and we'll go right ahead to Louis Spohr. And Spohr is a, a, a really interesting composer. I know him because he wrote a lot of clarinet music, which I studied when I was younger. And um, Spohr lived in Vienna for a, a while and really uh, uh, came there to make a name for himself. He got to know Beethoven. Um, and he wrote a nonet, which adds two additional instruments to the septet in Beethoven's, uh, in Beethoven's instrumentation. And we're just playing a wonderful finale from this. It's, it's very characteristic of Spohr's music, and that's why I wanted us to hear it. You could, you could really um, hear this rondo um, at, at, a, at a, an event at someone's palace out in the countryside, maybe a summer event. And um, I hope that it will give you the flavor for uh, the kinds of music that was being written after Beethoven's septet. This piece, I think, comes about 13 years after the septet. Um, so still, this style is very strong. And then a decade later, we hear Schubert approach the serenade in the form of his octet. And it is simply the greatest piece in its form. Um, it's very interesting to present the Schubert on this concert because it's a far greater piece than the Beethoven septet. But in a way, we're tying it into the septet very strongly. Uh, I think in a way suggesting that um, Schubert might not have arrived at the octet had Beethoven not written the septet. Um, and so, so that's, you know, I think a really clear example through this week's programming of how we're looking at Beethoven. We know Beethoven wrote some unbelievable masterpieces. You know, we can just exhaust all our fingers and toes talking about them. The symphonies, several of them being among the greatest symphonies ever written. The piano sonatas, the string quartets. Some of these things are entire bodies of work that uh, are going to remain critical for anyone who is interested in listening to music. Uh, but Beethoven also um, experimented quite a bit. He wrote music that at times seems unfinished, and I think that's a really very important part of his legacy. Um, he doesn't have that polish that we get from Mozart, but I think because of that, he's a much more fascinating figure. He certainly has been through history. He was a giant in the 19th century. Almost every major composer venerated him, and many artists outside of music also really venerated Beethoven during the 19th century. And so his impact culturally is enormous. And I was hoping that the concert tonight could demonstrate some of that to you, as well as kind of bring on that consideration of 
his roots, where he came from, the world that he came into, especially when he moved to Vienna uh, and set up shop there, became one of the leading composers of his generation. So I don't want to take too much more time in our pre-concert chat because um, we want to let you be able to switch over to the premiere right at 7. It's going to be very exciting. A reminder that all of this material is going to be available for you to view at any time for free. And we want to just do a huge thank you to a number of supporters. We've had a lot of people participate in our Ready to Play campaign and want to thank everybody who's been a part of that because that's what's enabling us to be here with you at all tonight doing these special programs. Waterloo Community Foundation ended up being a sponsor of this week because we had some grant funds that we shifted to this purpose. And then we've got some folks on the call, Dave and Dee Vanavanner, who graciously agreed to step up and become lead sponsors for our digital offerings. And, and that's just been so meaningful and allowed Blake and myself and Rich to really dive in and do the hard work of bringing this music to you. So if we could do some more applause emojis, I'm going to do my own applause here in person. Um, Thank you, Dee, and to the foundation, and to everybody who's participated in supporting what we're doing now. We, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments, we can, we can throw them in right now if uh, folks want to chime in or, or leave a note in the chat. Well, the best, the best thing about Zoom is as soon as we come off of mute, you get to hear everybody's kids in the background. Those are mine just running inside. So uh, I held them out until the end, the finish line of our chat. Uh, well, let me suggest then, in the absence of any further conversation, join us for the premiere. You can also chat with me in the comments of both the Facebook video as well as the YouTube stream. And I will be in both places, adding some commentary and answering questions tonight. And once this is all done, we'd love to hear what you thought of this week. We can't wait to bring some more digital content to you, but we'll also learn quite a bit from what happened this time around. So please do let us know if we can make any changes. And with that, we're going to sign off our pre-concert chat and switch over to the premiere.